Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be yet another solved case for my Curious Case series. I just had to give a massive thank you to the people over at Hunter Killer for working with me on today's video. Hunter Killer is a monthly subscription box that allows you to unleash your inner detective. They send you a fictional cold case to solve every month, leaving you to go through the evidence, decode ciphers, piece together the clues and ultimately crack the case. Over the span of a few months, you you'll receive more and more clues that will aid you in solving the case. And not only are you solving a fictional case with your subscription to Hunter Killer, but you're also aiding in solving real cold cases. With each box sold, Hunter Killer donates to the Cold Case Foundation, which is a charity that, according to their website, is devoted to raising public awareness of cold cases and assisting law enforcement with whatever resources are needed to bring about closure. If you're interested in diving deep into a fictional cold case and putting your detective skills the tests, then be sure to go check out Hunter Killer at hunterkiller.com forward slash Joshua Miles and you can use discount code MILES for 20% off your first box. I'd also like to just quickly let you guys know that we do have an official subreddit for this channel over on Reddit where we discuss the cases after they go live and discuss other cases. You can also request cases over there too and it's just a little community that I thought I'd create so that we can have a respectful, safe, place to discuss true crime outside of YouTube. So if that's a little community that you're interested in joining uh, completely for free, then head over to reddit.com slash r slash Joshua Miles. You can find a link in the description and in the pinned comments. Today's case is quite complex and involves a lot of people and a lot happens within a short space of time. So I've tried to, uh, in the edit, I've tried to have more of a cohesive timeline um, so that you guys, uh, it's easier for you guys to follow along. And with all that being being said, let's delve right into this case. On Saturday the 6th of June 2009, 15-year-old Swedish girl Thais Johansson Rojo was attending a party with her friends to celebrate the summer and the upcoming prom in Sturby, which is located just outside of Stockholm, Sweden. Therese told a few of her friends at this party that she was going to go off to the toilet in the woods and that she was going to go off with a boy so they could, you know, have a little talk. And she told them that she'd be back soon. Her friends didn't think much of it, presuming they were going to just have a private talk. But when Therese didn't return half an hour later, they grew extremely concerned. The friends ventured out into the woods to find Therese, expecting her to still be with the boy they had seen her leave the party with half an hour prior. But sadly, the friends were confronted with a scene of horror. They found Therese badly beaten and collapsed on the floor. Immediately contacting the authorities at 12.46 a.m. in the early hours of June 7th, 2009, ambulances raced Therese to a nearby hospital where sadly she succumbed to her wounds and passed away. What happened to Therese in those woods? Who was the boy that she had gone in there with and why had this happened to her? In a case that would rock the Swedish public and create a massive conversation surrounding juvenile sentencing in Sweden, let's delve into the case of Therese Johansson Rojo. Therese, known to her family and friends as Tess, was born on the 17th of June, 1993, in I believe Stockholm, Sweden, to parents Raymond Johansson Rojo and Vibeka Johansson. As with so many of the cases that we've discussed on this channel, Tess had a fairly regular childhood. Nothing of significance occurred within the context of this case. Her father, Raymond, was actually Filipino, which meant that Tess was half Filipino and half Swedish, her mother being Swedish. They would often try to make trips out to the Philippines to see her dad's side of the family who still lived there, though due to the cost of flying out there, this unfortunately rarely happened. Their visits to the Philippines were few and far between. Tess actually has an online blog which is still accessible to this day, which she used as a sort of public diary of her life and her passions. On this blog, she posts about how much she loved the Twilight series, how much she enjoyed fashion. She posted about 
body positivity and makeup, and even the occasional post about her mental health. The overall impression that you get from reading Tessa's blog is that she is a very clued in teenager who is facing the same trials and tribulations that most teenagers at high school face. She frequently posted photos of her and her friends having a good time, and up until March of 2009, she also posted about her boyfriend Gordon, uh, how she loved him, and pictures of them together as a couple. The posts show her expressing her love for him. Though at some point in March of 2009, the couple, through a mutual decision, ended things after over a year together. Tess didn't appear to be overly upset at this breakup. She did have a really good support network of friends and family around her. You can see in this image taken from her blog that she was always having a good time with her friends, from dressing up as the Spice Girls to just hanging about. Tess had a few Swedish exams which she passed with grades that she seems very happy with according to her blog. The future for her was bright and full of opportunities, dreams and hopes. But for now, the most exciting thing that Tess was focusing on was the end of year prom, the end of ninth grade prom. For those of you who may not be aware of how the Swedish education system works, between the ages of 7 and 16, students attend a comprehensive school with 9th grade being the last year of the school. Following 9th grade, students would go on to a higher school or high school, which is for ages 16 to 19, and after that students would go on to university or something similar. This 9th grade prom marks the end of a major period in Tess and her friends' lives, with many who she grew up alongside in school going on to different higher schools, everyone going their separate ways. Anyone who's been through this period of of their life knows exactly what this feels like. Tess had picked out a dress way ahead of time and by the looks of her blog posts she was so so excited to go to this prom and wear this dress and just have a good time with her friends and celebrate the end of her ninth grade. According to one source, she even had a date for the prom whose name was Dennis. Tess was described by her friends as being very popular at school and being very, very pretty. She was kind, had no enemies, and always went out of her way to help others, sometimes ignoring her own needs first. At the start of May in 2009, Tess went to a party to celebrate Valbor night with a few of her friends and ended up jokingly kissing a 16-year-old boy named Tim Vrogord. A drunken kiss that would set off a catalyst of events leading to that fateful June Saturday night. That Saturday the 6th of June 2009, Tess woke up at around midday to 1pm and had a fairly relaxing day helping her family prepare the house as they were having a friend from the United States come to stay later that day. As evening approached, Tess mentioned that she was going to go to a party that evening with a few of her friends but in typical teenage fashion it didn't really reveal much more information than that. As Tess's mum took her father, brother and the American visitor to a friend's house to watch the football, Tess got herself ready and left the house to meet up with her friends for the night ahead. She had told her mum that she was going to a party in the Hundals district of Stockholm, though this wasn't the case. Tess and her friends had actually intended to have a little party on the old skiing hill of Ian Kuenda. The skiing hill had been shut down since the early 90s and was the perfect place for the group of teenagers to have a party, let their hair down and celebrate not only the start of summer, but the end of the comprehensive school education and the upcoming prom, which some sources claim was due to take place just a couple days after the party. Tess and her friends took public transport to get to the skiing hill and they arrived at some point between 9pm and 9.30pm. The teenagers had sourced alcohol, they had a portable speaker, and I believe they had brought the resources to have a small fire to keep them warm as they danced into the early hours of the Sunday morning. From the time that Tess and her friends showed up at the old skiing hill up until 11pm, a trickle of people, uh, more teenagers, came and joined the party, with word of the party spreading through presumably text messages. 
messages. There were about 20 to 30 teenagers partying on the old ski slope that night, with the majority of that 20 to 30 people uh, all attending the same comprehensive school as Tess. Everyone was drinking alcohol that night, though Tess and her friends weren't really that interested in getting drunk, so they only had about one to two glasses of a vodka drink each. At 10.23 p.m., Tess's mother, Rebecca, rang her and Tess confessed to her that they had actually gone to the old ski slope for a party. Rebecca could tell that Tess was a little bit drunk, though she seemed to be pretty happy. She told Tess that it was probably time that she came home. After all, Tess was 15 years old, uh, and Tess agreed to this. It was then arranged that Tess would go home with her best friend, Ina, who was being picked up by her mother from the slopes at 11.30 p.m., meaning Tess would be back home and in bed before midnight. This also meant that Tess had an extra hour to continue celebrating at the party. Amongst the trickle of teenagers that had joined the party was Tess's ex-boyfriend, Gordon. At some point between 10.30 p.m. and 11 p.m., Gordon and one of Tess's friends, Jennifer, had walked a little bit away from the main party into the woods so that they could talk about Gordon's relationship with Tess. You see, despite the mutual breakup, Gordon was still head over heels for Tess. A few weeks after they had broken up, he had realized that he was still in love with her and that he wanted to get back with her, though these feelings weren't reflected by Tess. Tess's friends knew that Gordon was still in love with her and they weren't quite sure whether Tess wanted to get back Back with him or not. Um, they could see that Tess was having a good time without him. While Jessica and Gordon spoke, Tess actually came over to them and sat next to them, which caused uh, the pair to quickly change the topic of conversation because they didn't want Tess to know that they were talking about her. They started talking about the summer ahead of them and all the plans that they were making, but before long Jessica realised that Tess wasn't going to leave to go back to the main party, she seemed to just stay sat with them. So Jessica whispered to Tess to say that she was fooling around with uh, Gordon and upon hearing that Tess realised that they didn't really want her to be there so she went back to the party. And Gordon and Jess went back to their secret conversation. After a short while at about 11 p.m., Tess came back over to the pair and sat down on a tree stump next to them, telling them that she really needed the toilet. Jennifer told Tess that people had been going to the toilet in the woods, so if she was desperate then she should go into the woods and relieve herself. And so Tess began to venture into the woods where she actually bumped into her best friend Ina, who I mentioned earlier she was going to go home with. Um, and Ina also needed the toilet, so they decided that they would go to the toilet together. So the best friends ventured further into the woods so that they could relieve themselves. While doing so, however, they overheard a man's voice on the phone. They recognized this voice to be the voice of Tim Vrogord, who was the boy that Tess had kissed at the party three weeks prior. Tess had actually felt very, very guilty about this kiss, and she felt ashamed that it had happened. As Tim actually had a girlfriend who he was really committed to and they seemed to be in a really good relationship so she felt really guilty that she had kissed him and potentially ruined this relationship. And that girlfriend was called Tove Lind. Both Tim and Tess had immediately agreed following this kiss to keep it a secret and keep it between themselves and not tell anyone that it happened. But the guilt of the situation consumed Tess so she decided to confide in her closest friend's what had happened in her best friends, like most people would in such a scenario. She wanted to get their advice. Ina and Tess overheard Tim saying on the phone in the woods, something along the line of, Tove, I will, I will. The two girls then finished up their business and decided to head back to the main party, though as they began to set off back to the main party, Tess told Ina that she was going to go over to talk to Tim about the situation, just you know, to clear the air a bit. Ina said okay, and Ina went back to rejoin the party, and Tess went over to talk to Tim. After a short while, Tim and Tess emerged from the woods together and bumped into Gordon and Jessica, who were still talking 
uh, just on the outskirts of the woods. Tim was actually a friend of Gordon, so when they bumped into each other, everyone just exchanged hellos and that kind of, you know, normal greeting kind of thing before Tess and Tim went back to the main party, or so Jessica thought. It's important to note that Tim's girlfriend, Tove, had also been at the party for a short while, though when Tove was at the party, she only spoke to Tim and nobody else and was only there for maybe half an hour before leaving. Though what's interesting is Tess and Tim did rejoin the main party as um, Jessica suspected, though they weren't in the main party for very long before they decided to go back off into the woods again because Tess um, needed the toilet again. That, well, at least that's what she told people when they went back into the woods. When 11.30 p.m. came around, Ina shouted down the slope to Tess to tell her that her mother had arrived to pick them up and that it was time to go. Ina assuming that Tess had gone down the slope to pick up her bag. Though people at the party told Ina that Tess had gone back into the woods to use the toilet again, so Ina decided that she would just wait for her to finish. A short time passed before Ina decided to phone uh, Tess, though Tess didn't pick up the phone. Ina then decided to go in and get Tess from the woods, presuming that she might have fallen asleep or passed out or maybe tripped and hurt herself while peeing or something to that effect, so she began to call her name out. At 11.57 p.m., Ina received a text from Tess that read, I'm coming, and upon receiving this, Ina decided to sit and wait for Tess back at the ski slope. While Ina was waiting, her mobile phone ran out of battery power, which meant that she didn't have a way to contact her mum and let her know what was going on. A further 10 minutes then passed before Ina decided to go join a group of people from the party who were uh, hanging out by a subway, a nearby subway. You see, Tess had actually disappeared before on these social occasions on nights out, so Ina wasn't too concerned. Although Ina's mum had grown very irritated as she had been waiting for 40 minutes. At around the same time, Tess's mum, Rebecca, tried to call Tess to see where she was as she was supposed to have been back home by now. However, Tess didn't pick up the phone. Rebecca began to grow quite worried, though she imagined that perhaps Perhaps maybe Tess's phone had run out of power or they were stuck in traffic or they were delayed somehow, you know, rational explanations. She decided that she would sit up and wait for Tess to come home, not only so that she could make sure Tess was okay, but also so that she could thank Ina's mum for bringing her home. Now, Ina's mum wasn't just set to bring back just Ina and Tess. She was also due to bring back one of their friends who was called Felicia. Felicia was in in their uh, tight-knit group of best friends. Felicia and Tess had been friends for the best part of six years, and when Ina expressed that her mum was really frustrated uh, waiting to Felicia, Felicia told her that she should go um, with her mum, go home, and Felicia would wait for Tess to come out of the woods, and then they would go on public transport to get home. And so Ina and Ina's mum left the ski hill. Felicia fortunately wasn't waiting alone as five of their friends, uh, the people who were waiting by the nearby subway, were still there. So she waited with them for Tess to come back from the woods. Though as time began to tick by, they all began to grow more and more concerned. Felicia contacted a friend that had been at the party and asked when they had last seen Tess, to which Felicia was told that they had last seen Tess with Tim going into the woods. The small group, uh, just before half past midnight, decided after numerous attempts to phone Tess to go into the woods and get her. As they walked towards the woods, Felicia found Tess's bag which she had brought to the party and left where they were partying. Um, and she looked inside and Tess's phone wasn't inside the, the bag. By this point, Gordon, Tess's ex, had come back from his talks in the wood and had joined the search party. Along with Gordon came Jessica and Jessica's boyfriend, William. So they all joined the search party. Gordon decided it would be a good idea to phone Tess's home to see whether she had just gone home without them realizing. One of the girls in the group then phoned Tess's home phone and Tess's mother picked up she asked her whether Tess was there, and when her mother said no, uh, they hung up. Gordon then decided it would be best if Tess's mother knew what was going on, so he 
as he was uh, her boyfriend for a long period of time, she ha he had uh, Tess's mother's personal mobile phone number. So he phoned up uh, Tess's mum and told her that she was missing. Gordon and Tess's mother, Rebecca, stayed on the phone with, a with one another in constant contact while they searched. The group of teenagers had now faced with the reality of the situation, completely sobered up, and began to search through the woods looking for, for Tess. They thought that maybe Tess had fallen and hurt herself or perhaps she had passed out. It was really cold uh, at this time uh, at night. The temperatures got really, really cold. So it was, it was important that they found her and made sure she was okay. Jennifer tried to phone Ina to see whether Tess was with her, but Ina didn't pick up as her phone had died. Jennifer then also tried to ring Tim's phone, but it didn't connect due to the lack of service. One of the teenagers then decided to ring Tove, who is Tim's girlfriend, to ask whether perhaps uh, Tess went home with Tim or Tove or with them, to which Tove replied saying that she hadn't come back with the two of them. At 46 minutes past midnight, Emma, who was one of the best friends in Tess's friend group, phoned 112 and reported Tess as missing and then stayed on the line. While she was on the line, Emma suddenly heard screams that they had found Tess, but that she was in a really bad condition. Everyone rushed to where Tess had been found and saw that she seemed to be lifeless. She was laying on her back with a wound on the left temple, a large wound on the chin, blue lips, blue marks around her neck, and blood coming from her eyes and her mouth. Though it's important to note that at this point, she still had a weak pulse. The authorities on the phone to Emma then began issuing a resuscitation instructions. Two adults then arrived on the scene who it actually turned out that these two adults were the parents of two of the teenagers at the party and they began to administer CPR on Tess. Rebecca, unaware yet of the scene that had just been discovered, then phoned Ina's home phone at 54 minutes past midnight, asking whether they knew where Tess was and they replied no. Right afterwards, Gordon phoned Rebecca and told her that they had found Tess in a bad state, and Rebecca told them that she would drive there right away with Tess's older brother. Following that brief conversation with Rebecca, Gordon was then phoned by Ina, and he told her that Tess had been found in a very bad state. By the time that Tess's mother Rebecca and Tess's older brother had arrived at the ski slope, the ambulance service and the police had arrived on the scene. At about 1.30 a.m., the ambulance crew decided to prepare to move Tess to the ambulance so that she could be taken to hospital. This was at about the same point that Rebecca had arrived, and when she arrived, she ran from her car to the scene and immediately broke down. Tess was then put in the ambulance, joined by her mother and her older brother, and then rushed to a nearby hospital, where she would sadly succumb to her injuries. But what had happened to Tess. The police immediately began questioning the teenagers that had found her. They also immediately sent officers to the homes of the teenagers that had gone home, including sending an officer to Ina's home. Ina told the police that Tim had been heard saying, I'll beat Tess so the makeup disappears so you can see how ugly she is at the party. She also told the police that Tove had been overheard telling her boyfriend Tim, if you love me, you will kill Tess. Further to that, Ina claims that more um, evidence along those same lines could be found on uh, Tim's mobile phone as somebody had overseen text messages sent between uh, Tove and Tim which seem very graphic and very violent. The police immediately went to Tim's house and he was arrested at 5.05 a.m. on suspicion of murder. Tove was arrested two hours later at 7.05 a.m. on the suspicion of indictment to commit murder. By Wednesday the 10th of June, after undergoing intense interrogation, Tim confessed to manslaughter. While Tim was undergoing investigation, his mobile phone and his laptop and Toe's mobile phone and laptop were both seized and searched. It was determined that more than 20 text messages had been sent between the couple discussing the crime. Toe was moved to a psychiatric ward to undergo psychiatric evaluation and psychiatric care. On Thursday the 11th of June, 
Tim confessed under new interrogation to intentionally killing Tess. The preliminary autopsy report was also completed at that time, which showed that Tess had died due to uh, suffocation and not due to any impact wounds. On the 7th of August 2009, the trial in this case began. Tim was officially charged with murder and Tove was charged with indictment to murder. During the trial, it was revealed that Tim was actually engaged to Tove and Tove had given Tim a ultimatum on multiple occasions, claiming that she would leave Tim if he didn't kill the 15 year old Tess. This ultimatum was backed up with evidence evidence uh, of text messages sent between the couple. Tim then took the stand and told the court what had actually happened that night. Tim and Tess had gone into the woods at just before 11.30 p.m. to talk about the relationship. Tess had sat down on a stone while Tim had been standing. She told Tim of how guilty she had felt about the kiss and that she had been so consumed by guilt that she had told her closest friends about them, despite promising Tim that she wouldn't tell anyone. This angered Tim severely. He grabbed a stick and hit her in the back of the head, to which she confusingly asked him what the hell he was doing. Tim then immediately attacked Tess, put his arm around her neck in a chokehold, and strangled her until she stopped moving. After a while, Tim decided that Tess was likely dead, and the deed was done, so he began to walk away. Though Tess began to make a noise, and this just pissed him off more. He grabbed a large branch and pressed it against her throat while kicking her stomach. When he was satisfied that she was dead, he fled the scene. Strangely, Tim only pleaded guilty to manslaughter, which is insane to me because what he is describing is literal murder. Tove then took the stand and told the courts that the text messages that she had sent to Tim telling him to kill Tess were just part of a game and she didn't believe that he would actually go through with it. It was all just you know, a stupid game. Tove pled innocent on all charges. Despite their claims, the evidence against them was overwhelming. Both teenagers were subsequently found guilty of the murder of Tess and were ordered to undergo psychiatric evaluation before a sentence could be determined. The psychiatric evaluation being used to determine those sentences. In late October of 2009, both Tim and Tove were found to have no psychiatric disorders at all, so literally nothing wrong with them psychiatrically. The court awarded both the teenagers with the maximum penalty for juveniles, which is just four years of closed youth care. Though because they were both 16, it meant by the time they became 18, uh, they couldn't be charged anymore, so they'd have to be set free, which meant that they would only serve 20 months for the brutal murder of a bright, young, intelligent woman. That's one year and eight months. That would mean that by the time that Tess's friends had got to their final year of high school, Tim and Tove would be released. Their best friend's murderers would be released. Tim and Tove are also ordered to pay 145,000 Swedish krona each to uh, Tess's family in compensation. Crazily, Tim and Tove both had the nerve to appeal their sentences. It's an already ridiculously short sentence and they had the nerve to appeal it. They were both released in 2011. What has become of them since is unknown as I presume their identities have been protected. In my view, true justice was not found in this case. I definitely believe that they should have been charged with longer sentences or at least given tried as adults or something to that effect. I completely understand how the Swedish judicial system is set up um, to enable rehabilitation, but for such a senseless murder, 10 years minimum, like life, the Swedish life sentence minimum, like that's 10 to 15 years, like it just doesn't make sense to me. Does it not make sense to begin that rehabilitation after 10 to 15 years and not one year and eight months down the line? You can see how the public in Sweden was outraged by this sentence. Let me know what you think about this case uh, in the comment section down below and over on the official subreddit. You can find Tess's and one of Tess's friends Emma's personal blogs in my sources down below if you wanted to go read them and get a better idea of who Tess was as a person. And that's everything that I have for you in today's case. Thank you so much for watching 
this episode of my Curious Case series. Again, thank you to Hunter Killer for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video. Follow me over on Instagram and Twitter if you want to see what's going on outside of YouTube with me. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.